Live from DashCon 2018, it's the Going Off Podcast with rap critic, muse, and special returning guest, Dorian Dawes. I'm drowning in a ball pit right now. See, is there anything more gross than a ball pit? Why would you, why would that even be a selling point? Well, I mean, it is a ball pit that is not in a McDonald's filled with kids that, you know, just ate and, you know, drank and just, you know what I'm saying? That's just going straight through them so they're peeing and that shit. Yeah, oh man. Dude, you ever think about the fact that, like, like really think about the fact that when I say, like, uh, the, the jungle gym and a McDonald's, like, you immediately think of that warm piss. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's just ingrained there. And it's just like, for God's sakes, did no one, like, is how many people are not house training their freaking children? I don't know if you've noticed, I don't know if it's the same around there in, uh, in your neck of the woods, but... They've been transforming all the McDonald's around here in just gray, sterile boxes. Well, have you seen the updated uniforms? It's like McDonald's has updated its aesthetics for the global rise of fascism. They're like, oh no, this is all about this. This, this is great. Brutalism, here we go. There, they already got their Mylar suits. See, that's the one thing, though. It looks creepy and just you know, hard angles and all that, but they still got the play place. That would have been, like, the first thing I thought would have went. But no, it's still just kind of hanging in there like a relic, a reminder of the fun and nostalgia and childhood memories that McDonald's is, like, associated with because of, like, the Ronald McDonald aspect. But then on the other hand, you look at the menu and they're, like, trying to be taken super serious and all that. So they got, like, two identities going on at the same time. What would be dope is if they updated it for, like, adults, made, like, an adult play place McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? That's just a Dave and Buster's. Hey, maybe that's it. Maybe Dave and Buster's is just going to be the next McDonald's, and that's just the end of it. You know, because they evolved with the times. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, you say that you can't go back and the nostalgia isn't there. And you know what? About a month ago, I would have agreed with you. Because we recently went, like, I don't even know what brought it upon us to think about, but we just went to McDonald's and we're like, we want McDonald's fries. And the last time we did it, it was a disappointment. They weren't nearly as good as we remember. You ask for the fresh fries and then it all comes washing back. So I had that one success story in, what, five years? Fresh. Yeah, you, you gotta get the fresh for 2018. You gotta get the hot as hell fries. Because if they've been sitting around, like, at all, it's already gone. You gotta ask for it by name. <laughs> the, the speakeasy of fries. But uh, see, for me, like, the wet, cold, soggy fries, that's my childhood McDonald's memory. And it forever, like, when I get actually good fries from McDonald's, I am surprised and shocked. <laughs> I'm sending these back. These are not the fries I remember. <laughs> <laughs> we got uh, the whole Tumblr aspect that we alluded to at the top. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Just, just put a pin in that ball pit right there. Darren, you mentioned something at the very top because you were talking about how shitty my computer that is only, what, two, three years old? How Lupe uh, warned yeah. us of the... Uh, Planned obsolescence. Video games, like old school Nintendo and shit, you can t still turn that shit on today. It works like a charm. You turn on, you know, an Xbox from like 10 years ago and, you know, you, uh, that red ring of death. You know what I'm saying? It is, it is like a prominent enough thing where it's a problem. And so it's like, and, and the thing about it is, is like as video games and consoles have grown on, they've added on more things. It's not just the video game. Now you can watch a movie on there. Now you can go on the internet on there. You know, and it's like, what is that costing in exchange for it? Not saying I don't like it, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's like there are things that you are giving up, which is what uh, I wanted to talk about. Lupe Fiasco and like growing up and like learning things from songs. And I, I just feel like I've learned a lot from like rappers like Lupe Fiasco or like, you know, Ghostface Killer will, you know, offhand say something and I'll be like, what was that a reference to? And I'll be like. Oh, snap, there was this, uh, you know, like, I learned about the, the Waco, Texas, uh, uh, incident. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't really know anything about that until I listened to a rap song. Rap is a very reference-heavy genre, 
and only so often do you hear that in pop or I know I know just country kind of make it a point to for a while there every country song you'd hear come on the radio they have to name drop some country artist from like 20 years ago ah oh, he's the real deal because he's one of us he he likes the old stuff it might be a little dirt on my boots and there's always dirt on someone's boots and pickup trucks and it's like it's not even like it's funny when i when i listen to country music like i'm so immersed in hip-hop and then like when you go into another genre that's also at a very like blatantly commercialized state and you see like all their tropes that are really in your face and you're seeing how much the commercialization has led them to like jump to these buzzwords in order to like you know get people's attention and it's just like wow you really are saying the same things and it's mainly i've noticed it's uh, like it's mainly the guys you know now now and now there's less women in general but like whenever it's women i notice that there's a little bit more creativity that's allowed so what i've noticed there's there's two genres of country depending on the singer and it, this isn't a generalization of all the country as a whole it's just this is what i noticed prevalence as a trend male vocals on a country song are usually about like patriotism sitting on a back porch partying you know drinking hot girls and it's there's getting a bit more um uh, it's become aggressively conservative um (laughs) and then you get to female vocal country um and it's um usually about murder or at least like the threat of violence yeah <laughs> there, there's just it's just completely you know i mean not to say that all female country there's there's a lot of female country that's very light and poppy and it's fun and mm-hmm. silly but then there's a lot of female uh, driven country that's very much you know and then i ran him over with my truck <laughs> i think this is the subverting the expectation of well you wouldn't expect it yeah, and then that in itself has become... Well, I think also there's that be- that's become a form of identity. Or maybe it's just showing how angry white women are at their... <laughs> at white men right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get so many, like, angry country fans going, now that that is not... You have disrespected the art form, I have and- to say this, though. I have to say this, though. Shout out to fucking Dolly Parton, man. Oh, hell, Dolly. God, yes. Bless her. Darren, you're just now picking up what Dolly Parton's been putting down for decades. And, and the thing is, and the thing is, she's been right under my nose because you know I used to go to the Dixie Stampedes. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, and my what mom, the- my mom watched Nine to Five. You know what I mean? Oh, like, sure. Yeah. So it's like I'm thinking back and going like, "Wow, yo, she really was that chick." Like, oh snap! I re-listened to Nine to Five. Like that is straight up like that's the workers' anthem right there. Like, and it is not even on no subtle shit. And and, and it was interesting that you're saying like you know country music how it's kind of like watered down now. It's like, yo, she was on some spicy shit in 1981. She was talking about, yo, hey, they're they're taking money from you, man. Look, this is how they still fucking all of us over. And I was like, yeah, talk that shit. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, could you have a country singer talk? Look, look, last time a country singer talked too much, man, fucking Dixie Chicks, man. And that was a damn shame, too. Talking about the murder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now we're back to the murder. Because my sister and me used to fuck with Dixie Chicks heavy, and that's important because, like, you know, not a lot of black kids were into country. And so, like, Dixie Chicks were one of those first groups that was just like, oh, snap, wait a minute, you guys listen to it too? Oh, we both listen? Oh, snap, okay, it doesn't matter. You know, like, music isn't this, you know, thing that's split by race or whatever. Like, you know, it, and it, of course you don't overtly say it, but you kind of see it in who's in the music videos. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, oh, wait, no one cares because we all just love this music. It, you know, if it's good. Man, Landslide, yo, that shit is my... Look, all these celebrities that you hear about lately, they're like, oh, man, what a beloved icon that everyone knew and loved. And then it's like, oh, wait... They were horrible. Like, for me, like, Dolly Parton's like, I kind of knew who she was. And it was like, oh, yeah, she's over there. And it's like, oh, wait, she's actually awesome. Who's this person that I've actually been, like, kind of not been paying She's been to? consistently awesome since day one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she does She does do those Civil War reenactments that are a little... Uh, oh, no, really? Does <laughs> she? She does pull some unfortunate white people things. Uh, I'm looking up the name, but she has that. Um, but like, that she's bar. never had a Paula Dean moment. You know what I mean? No, no, um, no. She's never had a Paula Dean. I think it's very. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, she has a Civil War themed di- diner, and you can um, you and you can attend uh, as the Confederates or the Union. Oh yeah, that's that the Dixie the Stampede. Weirdest... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Dixie Stampede. Yeah, that's the weirdest damn thing I've ever <laughs> heard. <laughs> You've never heard of it? It's the parallel. No. It's the southern parallel to, um... Medieval times? Well, yeah, medieval times. <laughs> yeah, bro. We used to go to uh, Myrtle Beach all the time, man, during the summer. Shout out to your boy Nash uh, um, on Radio Dead Air. He was talking about how, like, yeah, you guys know they're still, like, ha- they still do tourism for plantations down here, right? Like, and, and I was... And as he was talking about... Like, he was talking about it as if, like... Oh my god, white people all around the world, you should be shocked by this. And it was like, my brain was just going like, as I was just used to it, I was just like, wait a minute. Yeah, that is kind of fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> now that you say it out loud. Yeah, it really yeah. is one of those things. <laughs> what we brought up to uh, Dan Owens Reed, because he runs a gender neutral uh, clothing line, uh, LA. They're doing a whole rebranding thing and they're adding a whole bunch of shit to the site and I want to hear all about it. But something that we brought up was that a trope in country is they'll talk about their girlfriends or wives and they always have to point out that they're wearing their t-shirt, a baseball cap, and no makeup. That's always the thing. It's always like, man, she's so down home. She's so real and natural. She looks so good in my shirt and my hat. And Dan mentioned it was like, yeah, because they don't want them expressing themselves too much. And that totally like clicked with me because you see now there was some some conservative person on Twitter. I think she had just gotten her hair dyed like purple and pinkish it was almost like a rainbow kind of like iridescent look and this guy chimed in and was like i don't know why women waste all this money on this rainbow hair no one likes it it's not attractive i was i was hoping that it would be an eye-opening moment for her of being like these are your people right but i think that's kind of the point is that colorful hair uh dressing funky or whatever being expressive as a woman is always labeled like SJW shit. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. So the inverse of that would be completely natural. No makeup. It's really bizarre is that they do they do tout this like natural look, but like the natural makeup look requires so much goddamn makeup. <laughs> and it just kinda it it does kind of show how very little the uh, word guys don't know though. Yeah, yeah. Um, as someone who's you know neither man nor woman, and I, I do wear makeup, it's like it takes more makeup, you know, to look to look to look natural for me. Whereas like if I want to glam out, that's easy, you know, swish a you know, devil may care where my eyeliner or eyeshadow flies, you know, that's that's easy. But I think that's me. what they're that, that's the idealization though, right? This girl's just so perfect. She 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 just doesn't need makeup. She just happens to look that perfect. She just you know? happens to have naturally long eyelashes that long. <laughs> you know what I'm you know? <laughs> yeah, no, like that's what they legit think, you know? It's a very homogenized uh, aesthetic where they have like, no, you look like this. And that's really what it boils down is to the um, the need to control, the need to, to make everything pressed into this very easily predictable, non-threatening uh, package that's is sexual in a way that is available to them but not other people it's it's very it's it's absolutely impossible like trying to fit into that box is a goddamn nightmare you know what would be funny to to do if someone like i don't know i don't know how to describe this like if they were to like idealize like listen to a hundred country songs and idealize the type of woman that all these guys are describing and then listen to a hundred like hip hop songs. You know what I mean? And a woman by algorithm. <laughs> because like the hip hop equivalent of that is like a bad bitch. You know, she's always got like she's got tattoos. She's real light skinned. You know, fat ass, big tit. You know what I mean? It's that like, very specific. You know, she's bisexual. You mm. know what I mean? You know a trope I picked up on, and now that you say that, it's the complete inverse of country. Because Jorian, you had mentioned that in country, there's a kind of culture of wanting to control. And it's sexy for me, but no one else. 
I've noticed it comes up so much in rap songs. Like, yeah, she's a bad bitch. She fucks everyone in my squad. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, she's so fucking bad. Uh, yeah. Everyone fuck. It's like, wow. I think I think about the the where hip hop is though. It is it's 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 far more expressive. Um, not that country can't be expressive. It's just that where our culture is right now with these music genres, I think. Um, there's a lot more diversity uh, in um, the opinions and the beliefs and the backgrounds of hip hop. Um, it's so you have like a, a whole bunch of uh, um, you can you can also be shit at hip hop. Hip hop is um, the new punk, or not the new. It's been around a while, but it, it is. It, there's a there's a punk element to hip hop, and that you can be um you can be absolute crap at it but you know if you're you know if you work work your ass off and you're aggressive and you feel it hard enough you'll find a following <laughs> i i've noticed this um and i think that is a lot for a wider range of um thoughts and ideas to come out of it during it's been a minute since we've had you on it's been since april uh roseanne was still on the air we talked about that uh, <laughs> back in back in the yesteryear you know five years ago in 2018 yeah mm -hmm, exactly um for those who aren't familiar uh with who you are uh just like a brief overview uh just let the folks know who you are what you do uh yeah uh i am dorian dawes i am a non-binary uh writer of science fiction fantasy and horror um, I came out with, uh, like in the time since I've been on the podcast, I came out with a science fiction novel, uh, called Mercs published by Nine Star Press. You can find that on Amazon, Smashwords, or anywhere else you like to purchase your fiction. And I also write articles and essays. I have a Patreon that you can check out, patreon.com slash Dorian Dawes. Um, and I'm currently working on revisions to a third book um, that it's not nearly ready to talk about yet. <laughs> One of the issues that we wanted uh, to talk about specifically, and everyone's talking about it right now, so what some consider uh, to be, I'm just going to be that, uh, that open-ended, not taking a stance, not now anyway, reactionary response to that there was presence of uh, CP. On old, an old Tumblr. In response, uh, it was taken off the Apple App Store. All this, it was uh, not looking good for your boys, uh, Tumblr. In a, a drastic uh, measure, they just decided, well, fine. We're going to take all the adult content off the website. And then you have nothing to say. You'll have nothing to complain about. I've seen a few different takes. That this is taking a very accessible place away from uh, queer content creators and artists, uh, sex workers specifically. Since then, what I'm seeing people also point out is that not only is it um, adult content that is getting flagged, it is essentially every thing is getting flagged uh drawings of yeah, tumblr no longer allows any content on its, See, the, <laughs> its platform that's, apparently that's what i'm trying to figure out from from the both of you. I, I want both your takes on this because from my perspective it looks like they're just trying to do themselves in like this is their way of taking themselves out of the picture because like i said it isn't just females presenting nipples it's hyper-realistic drawings of dogs it's abstract art it's their own announcement that they would be taking adult content off the website it's all getting flagged so this looks like it's going beyond an algorithm thing because how would an algorithm recognize their announcement text post as adult content some users have theorized this and this isn't i'm not a techie person anyway so don't quote me on this but it looks like it's flagging certain posts with tags that's picked up in its algorithm. It's so oversensitive right now, though, that it picks up just the tiniest little thing. You know, can't can't post that teacher from Hey Arnold. Her face might look like a dick. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's <laughs> it, it's that oversensitive. What concerns me mostly, um, like I'm, I'm disappointed and I'm I'm sad about this. But I think most of what I I feel right now though is um. 
a lot of a lot of anger but not for my own behalf i didn't use it all that much but what i'm really mad is because in the wake of the uh fast and sesta bills that got passed there's a lot of websites that um no longer were able to be used by uh sex workers to facilitate their business uh in a way that was safe for them and so some a lot of them turned to tumblr for that end as well as other adult content creators who were doing so in an instant harmless way marking their blogs as uh, you know not safe for work um you know doing all the things hiding explicit material from minors they, they did everything that they're supposed to be doing and they're the ones that are going to be most significantly impacted by this because as we continue to shutter away online spaces where sex workers can conduct their business in a safe manner we're going to be opening them up once more to exploitation dangerous uh you know dangerous environments and creating a, a generally more hostile environment for them uh, people that depend on these spaces to you know conduct their business in a way that is safe and allows them to serve survive um it's this this deliberate puritanical uh purging of um sex workers from our society uh that has continued to alarm me um and then the fact that this alg algorithm is so intense and uh that it has flagged uh queer people holding hands hugging each other um fully clothed completely safe for work but you know it's our culture considers all forms of same-sex attraction and all queer relationships as adult, as lewd, as something subversive that must be hidden away from the children. And so what you are also seeing in effect of this is a purging of all LGBT plus content from the platform too. I think it was uh, last year as YouTube was demonetizing several videos because our culture um, is still sees queer people as adult and um we think that algorithms are completely neutral but they're they're not we are the ones that program we are the ones that train this code we write it um and so it has all of our biases it has all the things that we think of as adult in it you know it's not a neutral ground there are biases there and one take that i would seen some people bring up this isn't exactly a, a hot take that uh that cp is bad well lots of adult sites have found a way to somehow keep in business without having cp as a problem right yeah <laughs> so when i see people say that this is an acceptable loss if it's getting rid of the cp get rid of the website what i haven't seen is people issuing what could have been a way to prevent this but like you had said i don't hear about twitter having a problem with this i don't hear a problem of youtube having a problem with this the worst youtube has are these weird spider-man and elsa videos that people keep, keep talking about <laughs> that's a that whole are... different issue <laughs> was it just like i don't know inattention on the back end that let this slip through the cracks to begin with well, I mean, I, I would say it's Occam's razor just throwing in my two cents. Just them going with some easy al algorithm that they could just go, oh, just do this, plug this in, and whatever requires us to pay the least amount of people so we can keep the most amount of money, let's do that. And then it's like, you know, they're probably, you know, I don't know, chilling in Barbados for like the last month. And then they come in, they're like, oh, crap, people don't like that? Oh, no. <laughs> and to be fair, that's it's not entirely inaccurate. Um, like, people, these websites, they don't want to spend money to actually uh, pay people to moderate their, their service. I mean, good lord, you know, how long have we been telling Twitter to just ban the Nazis? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> like, like, like t t Twitter might not have a CP problem, but it has a it has a very loud Nazi problem. Uh, which, uh, by the way, Tumblr seems to now be banning all the content, uh, but there's you can still post swastikas on tumblr that is still a thing that you can do the algorithm gets everything but the nazis so <laughs> the algorithm tumblr is, is, is like everyone is going to leave tumblr but the nazis each platform seems to have its own individual personalized problem youtube kind of shares <laughs> that problem with twitter unfortunately because curiosity gets people clicking on these videos they hate watch things and now when you hate watch something Still counts as a view. Yeah, that's true. You can watch something that is a response to the right. Like you can watch, you watch one ContraPoints video and then all of a sudden your entire feed is just spanned with PragerU ads. It's what I told people who were like, 
yeah, I mean, I watch Alex Jones videos, but just because he's funny, I don't, I don't actually believe anything he says. It's like, don't do that. That gives him money. <laughs> I really think most of the people that are his fan base are those people, and they don't realize how influential <laughs> their watch is. It's like a weird network sort of thing, where it's just like these people are watching this guy rant and rave. And they don't actually believe anything he says, but, you know, I mean, entertainment is entertainment. <laughs> it's just like, what the fuck? This is actually affecting people. What are you, crazy? It's the same as Trump on Twitter. Like, I don't understand. His tweets are going to find their way on your timeline somehow. <laughs> yeah! I, I hate it. I, I, I felt that way. Yeah, I... I... So what I did for my mental health, and it's it's unfortunate, but I encourage everyone to do the same thing. Um, because Twitter was getting really awful for me today. Like, and it was I used to follow like a lot of leftist accounts. Um, man, I and... had to start following some people I love too, because I'm just like, I'm sorry, man, I can't keep hearing about this, man. I can't Thank you. Do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like I I was I was following all these leftist accounts, and unfortunately, there's a big amount of leftists on Twitter that spend all of their time just quote tweeting dunks on right wingers and <laughs> here's the thing the the dunks are not great I'm sorry leftist Twitter you yeah. sh- you're, you suck at your dunking you're bad at it just stop you're bad retire and it doesn't affect the right winger all it does cuz they they're not they're not they don't give a shit Oh, but what you're doing is you're broadcasting Graham Lynam's like latest transphobic rant into my feed, and I had to see that before I go to work, or I had to see fucking you know Trump's latest piece of shit that he's decided to grace the world with, or I have to see fucking Ian Miles Chong's god awful whatever that he does. Just the, the marginalized people that you know are following you, and you're just you're just. Sp- putting this filth like right in front of them and we already live in a world like i i don't need to be reminded what the right thinks of me i'm well aware of it i i work at a gas station okay i i I've, if i want to be met with transphobic bigoted opinions i'll just go and sit in front of the cash register for a few hours <laughs> you know I'll, I'll hear it the more attention you give something the more powerful it becomes and i think that what we on the left really should be doing is highlighting things that are uh, that are good, that are uh, positive, that are progressive. Like we could be, God, we could be signal boosting marginalized people doing cool things. Yeah, right. You know, See? like like a really cool marginalized leftist. You know, made a cool documentary. Let's let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, that's, you know, that's what we got to support black artists out, out here. You know what I mean? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. How about we talk about some YouTubers that we like? I like Peter Coffin. All right. Diamanda Hagen. I adore her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I fucking, uh, I fuck with some more news. Old Cody, uh, Cody Johnston. I love his stuff. He's funny. His, his stuff can go get so dark, though, after a while. You're just like, all right, man, man. It like, can. I know it's all, <laughs> but yeah, and it's you like, know it's what? All I true. need it. And we, yeah, we all need, like, this is the info we need. But I'm like, I'm not sure if I can watch all the way through all the time. <laughs> um cat black i really like her stuff too mm-hmm. uh, uh, oh uh jenny nicholson y'all ever watch her uh, yes 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 yo i got into her videos through, there was this one uh video called like the most insane reality show ever and it, it really was the most insane reality like you don't understand it was so irresponsible and you're just watching the show going like who allowed this to happen? Like, it really was one of those things that was just like, oh shit, things fucked up, but our budget's already too much behind it. We've got too much money invested, so we can't stop now. <laughs> and the way she details it is just, it just had me in fucking stitches. So definitely check out Jenny Nicholson, if only for that fucking video, because that was definitely the one that got me into her. Now, Thought Slime was another one. Oh, well, Lindsay. I mean, she doesn't really need the help. But Lindsay Ellis. Yeah, Lindsay Ellis is is a uh, queen of YouTube. <laughs> Sean and Jen, he's like this British dude. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His yeah. voice is just so just like dry. It's like that Stephen Wright. It's like a British <laughs> Stephen Wright. And it's just like the way he just delivers, like uh the way I got into him was through the cinema sins. Where yeah, he was pointing out like all the obvious things that were like, if you just watch the movie, you would know. <laughs> and in the way he delivers it, where it's just like, I mean, if you just paid attention. 
<laughs> it's just like it's not like he's trying to like dunk on you. He's just like just trying to humbly point out like, oh, I mean, like you literally just showed this. How did you not know that that was there? You know, and, and he kind of he kind of exposes like you know these people. Um, sort of going through these videos and just looking for the cheap jokes without really watching the movie. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, looking for something wrong instead of, like, trying to enjoy the content, you know? I wish I watched more people who do, like, uh, video essays. I, I, I do honestly um, lean more towards the uh, the video game content, but with that... It's more like your uh, your Rooster Teeth channels like Funhouse who have actually been super critical of PewDiePie and don't really rely too much on that whole group. So I like that mm-hmm. they're kind of out there doing their own thing. Um, I watch a good bit of them. Yeah, um, most of the time I'm just catching up on Critical Role. Like I, so because I end up like working a lot. Um, normally, like me watching Critical Role is like I watch like an hour of it and then I go to work, and so I, one episode will last me an entire week. So that's that's my YouTube content right. that week. It's a four hour episode. I, you know, it's funny hearing like different people's YouTube routines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I pause the video, go to work. You know what I've been getting into? I've been getting into um this uh, podcast called the Talking Simpsons podcast. Podcast, where, oh yeah, um, I've, I've heard of that. Yeah, and I've been like because you know I stopped watching Simpsons a really long time ago. My problem mm. with my biggest problem, and I remembered it as I was watching back through the episodes. My biggest problem is like the celebrity episodes, man. They, their oh, voice yeah. acting is so bad, and like <laughs> you know the writers have to be nice to them so they can't really joke on them, and so it's just like it's like oh, an yeah. SNL you know uncomfortability where it's just like. We can't really make jokes, and they're not really that good at acting, so we have to really be soft. You know, it's like, no, I hate that shit. Come on, go in. But the one episode, I think it was the first episode they really had a celebrity, was Michael Jackson. And man, yeah, watch that Talking Simpsons episode, because that episode fucking blew me away. The detail um, behind getting Michael Jackson, but like not being able to uh, have him sing for the show. It's insane. Um, so shout out to the Talking Simpsons podcast. And uh, the they also do the Talking Futurama podcast, a show that I absolutely love to watch the shit out of. And just saying, if anybody just happens to know anybody who can get bug in the ear of those people, I'm just saying, you know, I, I, I could be a special guest <laughs> talking about the Futurama. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that's the show. But uh, concerning the um, Simpsons podcast, what I've been doing is, like, watching two episodes and then watching the podcast on the episodes. You know what I mean? Just sort of oh, like, that's cool. Yeah, and so I've been really enjoying it, like, going back through and seeing stuff that I've never seen before and seeing stuff that, like, you kind of remember. And it, one of the dudes put it on there very well. It's, like, it's like stuff that you've seen and it's you, it, you knew exactly how the jokes go and everything like that, but you just, because you were younger, you just didn't understand the context. Yeah. So it's, like, as you're watching it now, like, it's all filling in. It's, like, you already know the punchline, <laughs> but you're really understanding it now. It's been a fascinating journey. So shout out to them for sure. I guess that about wraps it up here. Uh, Dorian, is there anything you'd want to add on anything at all uh, before we part ways and uh, transition into the uh, album reviews? Organize. Let's start with J.I.D. of the 2018 Double XL Freshman Class and his album... DiCaprio 2. I, I I don't really get why. There's probably a reason. Yeah, if someone could fill us in, because I, I was like, is the idea that he's like a pretty boy? Because that's not really being played up at all. We got DiCaprio 2, Desposito 2, we got sequels yeah, all around. <laughs> I was like, um, but it doesn't even sound like I was it. expecting like, a Desposito sample or something. Yeah. Nothing. You know, it's interesting because this week I've been listening to, obviously, Earl, J.I.D., and our other boy, as I take another sip of Water, who also had an Mm. album drop uh, the same week, fucking uh, Ski Mask. And Mm. Ski Mask and J.I.D. had that one chef kiss uh, freshman cypher video where it was just the two of them. Oh, and, yeah. Ooh, 
and you fucking, you saw them kind of play off each other, and J.I.D. was like, I cannot wait for Slum God to rap right now, I'm so excited. Like, all the <laughs> fucking camaraderie, and I was like, you know what, I'm fucking jazzed, I'm psyched, I'm here for it, finally get that excuse. I was really looking forward to not having that trippy red moment, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and and I was, um, I was not disappointed entirely. Yeah. Um, this album comes at you very hard and it comes with a lot of personality some songs might not have hit as hard as other ones but overall i uh i had a pretty good time listening to this album and jid is um you know as much as i hear people um and i'm glad i wasn't the only person who caught this because i kind of figured that it was universal that he does kind of sound like kendrick sometimes yeah, like his little brother or something, you know? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that despite all that, there was still a good bit of uh, originality here. And, my God, Polish. This fucking album, mm. the beats on this album, they slap so fucking mm. hard. Like, Imagine way harder. <laughs> Ooh, way harder than I was expecting. Some of these, which ones do I have written down? Fucking Off D's and 151 Rum. All I my have Lord. written down for... All I have yes, written Lord. down for off D's <laughs> is ah. That's all I have written down because I couldn't formulate anything else. And you got how about this, my dude? Two weeks in a row, we've got good J Cole guest verses. Your boy J Cole coming through, <laughs> delivering. How Who about that? Who says he doesn't that? do featured verses or whatever the fuck the meme was? <laughs> oh, see, that's the thing. He doesn't have features on his albums because he wants yeah, to be yeah. known as the guy who does the good features. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I don't know. So, what do we got here? We got fucking Slick... T- well, no. Before Slick Talk, we got that weird uh, flipping through it. the radio station's intro. <laughs> the hell is I, going on there? The fucking British guy! I couldn't take it! That shit had me wrong. You know, I just... I love British accents just in general. Yeah. But just the fact that he was like, what did he say? He said, uh... I see guns with extended clips that don't even fit the guns in the trousers. So what he's trying to say is, I'm so tough, don't mess with me, I'm the baddest bloke on the block. (laughs) It was almost like listening to fucking uh, David Attenborough in a fucking, like, nature documentary. Yeah, that's the most British thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I'm the baddest bloke on the block. <laughs> like, 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 you cut to that guy's mind and he's like, yeah, I'm the baddest bloke on the block. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> now, I think it's easier in an album like this to first off talk about the ones that, um, that didn't hit me as hard and see, uh, see if we're on the same page here. Um, the songs that gave the lowest ratings... And that's not even to say that they were that low of ratings. Were uh, Tied, Hotbox. I know you're not talking about the joint with my boy M-E-T-H-O-D man on it. I know you ain't talking about when he comes through with the light of bugger up, wedgie in your butt, yup, we pulling up. I was like, oh no. <laughs> no like, it just came in so smooth. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Meth was the star of that track. Everything else, unfortunately, in my opinion, okay. uh, didn't measure up. I 100% credit. His verse was fire. I loved it. Uh, Badass's verse and chorus weren't that great. And my main complaint here, going back to Tide, is the special appearances. Black was... Okay. Oh, like, I liked Black's verse. Uh, uh, I wasn't a say? big fan of it. When he started, I was like, how you gonna leave with your number on my phone bill? <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that that's a, good a pretty line. real line right there. <laughs> I think it was because after that much of the album, to hear J.I.D. try a yeah, kind of like story thing. about a relationship, I was like, I don't know if this is really your type of Oh yeah, you could song, tell man. this was the I Have to Make the Love Song. He even had a little bit of, yeah. you know, he threw a little auto-tune on there, you know. Uh, that's what I was <laughs> like. It was clever at points, but I wasn't feeling it for the most part. It, when he was doing the little the, the little uh, trills the, on the tie, those little things, I was like, alright, that's kind of cool right there. Mm. But in the verses when he was doing it, it was just like, why, why are you doing this, man? Like, you're, 
Like, it's still pretty good for you. Like, it, he's one of those guys that, like, even on autopilot, it's not like it's bad, but it's just like, I don't know. You, you can, It's not like you can't do a love song, but, you know, I, I don't know. The album's almost an hour. You know, I didn't need it. Maybe take that one off. Because honestly... Man, fucking slick talk into Westbrook, into Ofties, and oh into my god, rum, into off the off the zoinkies, into working out. Wow! I just looked at uh, what I said for it because I, I had forgot. I was like, wait, how did the beef off the zoinkies go? Which is just a great title anyway. Off the zoinkies. Yeah, uh, I don't. <laughs> that's like the best anti-drug rap song I may have ever heard. Fuck even the message. That, like, piano sample that they looped. Ooh, yeah. That shit was yeah. lush. That shit was lush, my dude. <laughs> and he even had a cool little piano thing and working out, too. There, that, yeah, that right after came up every like, so often. Twinkly. That shit was like a, like a, like a Zephyr. Just, <laughs> you know, blowing through the track, man. That shit was beautiful. That shit sounded pretty. <laughs> my thing about G.I.D. is that, like, I hear his lyricism... And it's just like, whoa, man, his flow, that's what it is. His flow is just slippery as fuck. It's incredible. Yeah. He is like a, he is like a percussionist or a jazz instrumentalist. You know, like, that's what he kind of takes from Kendrick. He he kind of, mm. you know, that's what I hear. It's not just the voice. It's like how he really does play with the flow in a way that makes him more unique because he does more with it. But the thing is, he is more of that technician in the sense that, it, speaking of uh, technicians, uh, he's also kind of like in the vein of Tech Nine, but in the way mm. that like he's so concentrated on the flow of what's being said, and I do sometimes feel like what is actually being said is being sacrificed for how it sounds. So it's just like there are times when I'm not really getting a good like punchline or good hit or anything that would or would really be like I could quote this and you'd be like, oh, that's insane. But the flow That's is really true. insane. Yeah, I didn't highlight many, if any, lyrics. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I did. But I will say Westbrook was uh, an example of his creativity. Uh, we're, we're the first verse where he has the, I will not repeat myself. I will not repeat. Uh, well, anyway, and then <laughs> at the end of the, the verse, he goes like, yeah, I saw these cats flying, but hey, they say never, say never. I mean, we say never. I, I mean, we. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that dude a fucking guest first i didn't mind in aesop ferg mm. his chorus was hype yep i was like okay i thought this album was kind of uh front loaded um because the second half i wasn't as wild about can i say i didn't like the beat of rum the the slowed down howling dogs sample thing that was going on I kind of liked that. I liked the dog specifically. I remember that hearing that and thinking that was beat cool. I felt was kind of like overbearing. Hmm, okay. Another guest verse, I wasn't, and I get it, it, it was for the point of the song, but Scrawberries. Uh, BJ oh, the no, 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 no. I love Scrawberries, bro. See, that, that's where I'm getting to some of the songs that I actually really like. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Scrawberries was dope. You're always here for the slick R&B sample <laughs> on the rap song. You have a soft spot for that shit, and I'm what usually like, say? whatever about that. <laughs> what can I say, man? I, 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 I feel the value in it. I see the value in it, you know? Right. He's talking about this woman who's, done, who's dealt with all this shit, and it's kind of cool the way he kind of addresses it. He's like, from dealing with a dickhead, putting their life in danger. I understand it's times that you go through your woman things and sometimes can't gauge clearly on what you be thinking. I swear I got your back, though, in the tab that you be drinking. You ain't got to move a finger or a pinky when we link it. Like, I just kind of like that, like, I may not get it, but look, I'm always going to ride with you. And then, yo, that dope lyric where he's like, um... He says, uh, let's be realistic. I've been trying to get in touch with my senses and be better with my sisters, but niggas think that you're feminine when you're sensitive. My homie girl rap and she feminist. Hold it down for the women. I call her feminine. <laughs> I was like, that was kind of nice. If the 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 word feminine was just kind of like, uh, that's kind of played out. But I, I get what you're saying. Though. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. The only part of that song I wasn't wild about was BJ. I loved oh, okay. the verses. Which were apparently co-written by uh, J. Cole and uh, Mac Miller was involved in that one. Oh, man. Huh. I, I guess this was like the pre-album single, the bonus track, Costa Luego, but I didn't need it. I thought it was tight. I thought it could have ended at Desposito too, and I would have been fine. 
I, I, I don't think it should have ended on Despacito 2. <laughs> I, I think that could have not been there, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't my favorite either. But like I said, the whole second half isn't as strong, in my opinion, as the first. So, I mean, if we're talking about ending on a high note, you'd fucking, for me, you'd have to go back to either Hotbox or maybe even further to, uh, to working out. Because that fucking song, that was, that was, like, so much fun despite being about hard times. You know, like, uh, this shit ain't working out. I tried to talk to God and that shit ain't working out. Like, oh, that was such oh. a... F- that was also the one where I had the lyrics where he says, uh, that's why I don't fuck with niggas now. I, I fuck with all my niggas. You know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> I love little he does little touches like that that are actually like really interesting. Um in time, I don't know how to feel about the beginning of the verse where he goes like, How you gonna dump me and then leave with my hoodie and you ain't coming back, give me back my hoodie, and now you're trying to make a scene at the movies. You really wanna act, bitch, we at the movies. I was just like, I I feel like you're downgrading your skill somewhat for this song for a particular reason. It's like I get it because it's like conversational, but Mm, yeah. Overall, I don't really have too too much more to say about it, but uh cutting to the chase, uh I would give it somewhere between a three and a half and a four, leaning more towards a four. I would lean on that four. Yeah, I think it's solid enough. I think I think uh like no one would be you know I, I would never shit on someone for being a fan of this. Uh at the same time it's not like my favorite joint. You know, I like I I do feel like I was expecting a little bit more creative wise, but it's like you know I I I'll let it live. Like it's not it's not it's nothing that you should be ashamed of, as you know what I mean as, as their album. You know what I mean? It's not like you should be like, oh man, look, squandered potential. Like no, nah, you you did some cool stuff. It was just it, it just wasn't transcendental. But that's not something like I don't know. Now I feel bad because now it feels it feels like damn praise, right? To be like, oh, it should have been awesome, and now it's not. It's like it didn't. It didn't. Fi-. Like just the fact of bringing that up already feels like I'm downing him. It's just like no, it's a solid album. Four means solid, but it it really does feel like. But are you sure that was all? You like you didn't have any cool shit you were gonna do? I mean, okay, all right, no, no, it's fine, it's cool, it's cool. I mean, just- <laughs> I, I'm I'm sitting over here and I get it. Because his freestyle and his freestyle and the cipher were so fucking impressive, especially compared to some of the other ones that were in the class. But I mean, all that shit was on the album. Yeah, it's both just... of his freestyles are on this album. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't that I wasn't disappointed in that regard. Of I was expecting more. I mean, it was it was pretty on par with what I expected. Now transitioning into the part of the podcast where everyone fucking curses me out for an hour. Some rap songs by Earl Sweatshirt. I'm gonna go ahead and say straight out the gate, I was not a fan. I'll probably never listen to this EP again. Pretty much across the board, 1.5s. And I give it a 2. Cause look, I used to be down on you boy. Oh, stop it. (laughs) <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. I'm not even. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm Look. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Look. When I heard it the first time, I was like, all right. Okay. I, you know, you try to be a little MF Doom. You know what I'm saying? You try to do your little lo-fi hip hop. All right. You oh, know. okay. I was going to say, know, I did not hear any anything sounding anything like MF Doom, but okay, I got you. To me, what it, I described it as, it sounds like Earl was in a room with a microphone, and he had a laptop, and he was playing his beats on his laptop, and he was recording them both at the same time, because it sounds <laughs> so shitty. But, <laughs> yeah. but, that's not why I didn't like the EP. Like, I get it, if that's your fucking aesthetic. Like, I'm not gonna right. down you, if that's what you're going for. But, um, because there was a little bit of that on the last EP, not, not as much, which I kind of wonder what the, what the purpose or point of that is, because what we got on the last album was 10 songs at a half hour runtime. What we got here is 15 songs at 2439. I mean, these songs barely exist. Like, <laughs> there are only three songs 
that are two minutes or longer. There's one song that isn't even a minute. Yeah, these are shorter than MF Doom songs. Oh, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. They, and, like, I don't even think we could call it, like, these are just verses. Like, they're not even some rap songs. No, these are some rap verses. Th- these are, yeah, these are snippets. These are unfinished. This is fucking Kendrick's untitled, unmastered, but to the nth degree. I gotta say, on the second listen, when I was, like, listening to what he was saying, I kind of got a little, like, fascinated with what he was talking about. And how, like, certain themes kept repeating song after song. Like, uh, and I kept highlighting them. Like, nobody told me I could leave. Like, for some reason, he keeps repeating that in different songs. Um, uh, uh, What's that one? He talks about, like, a noose hanging off of his neck. And at one point, it sounds like he's just talking about a noose. And then the next song, it's like, nah, it's a noose of gold. I'm talking about, like, uh, a chain. And there's another song where he talks about, like, you know, he keeps saying, like, uh, chuck a deuce if you know it's the end. And, like, my friend called me because I told her it was the end. And, like, just, like, things he keeps saying, they're just like, why is he, like, what's going on here, you know? And and it's the sort of cryptic, um, like, I think Red Water is probably the best example. Like, listen to that song. If you can deal with that song, then you'll like this album. Because it has a very emotionally intense sample that's played the please help <laughs> like oh my god i kept i kept feeling like i was like i feel like like it gave me the emotional feeling of seeing someone drowning and needing to like jump in the water to save them you know what i mean like that's what the song gets sounded like and it was so perfect for the imagery that i kept bringing about of drowning and sort of being stuck underwater and things like that and it was kind of like it's so, like things were working out in a very abstract way that I was able to enjoy in some respects. Like I said, Red Water, it, like when you're as you're listening to it, you realize it's like, wait a minute, it's not just the beat that's being uh, sampled; it's him. He's just it's just repeating this short part, you know. And um, so it's like I don't know. There's little moments of that that kind of make me go like, oh wow, there's something very interesting and fascinating and oddly hypnotic going on in some of these songs. However, where, um, on some points where, man, some songs like December 24th, lyrics just seem to be spilling out of this dude. Like, um, where he says, I told you these niggas passing like the scent go. We pass the niggas, know we keep the gas and the spliff rolls. The wind get the ashes in the end, bro. We've been to get passing your credentials. Bad apple, daily clashing with my kinfolk. Bad ass, it did damage to my mental. I love that. I love the way he rolls out rhyme schemes like that. Um... But whereas some points where it'll he'll be getting into like very specified like stories of like pain and hardship that really dig into you and make you go like oh shit you know I really want to pay attention to what's happening other times he's just detailing stuff that's like I'm sorry I don't know why this matters that much like where he says yeah like I be with Mike and Med nowadays I be with Sage and with Six Press you dig. I'm in L.A. with Glenn. Please come claim your kid. I can't. I'm like, I don't. Why do you just talk about the people that you're hanging out with? I don't care. Like, you know, it's just like, uh, what, what does it matter that you're hanging out with these different people? You know? This album didn't really have anything for me in the sense of I thought his flow was okay at times. Other times it was, it, it just kind of bored me. And the very minimal looped samples were got they got so annoying to me see i i kind of i kind of grew up on those so i don't hate those as much but see, I, the I get it dream. they're kind of yeah. and the the these has has of, uh, <laughs> mm. oh my god and I it's love like the mint though come on that tommy davidson sample the mint was one that i liked a bit more um mm. And it's the longest song on the EP. Um, and where he was, like, jumping against the flow of the beat, you know what I mean? Yeah, that one I, I dug. It was like, an, he had a really odd, interesting pattern that kept me uh, that kept me involved, but I still didn't like it that much. Yeah, there's great experimentation, but, uh, like, like, The Benz, for example, that song straight up sounded like a woo-banger. Like, I was like, holy shit. But the lyricism, like, 
I couldn't even really find a lyric to quote, you know what I mean? And it's not that it's bad, it's just not, I'm not really interested in what he's saying, you know? I read along on Genius when I was listening to the songs, because, like I had alluded to before, the production is so, probably on purpose, just muddy. It's like a 444 sort of thing. Yeah, at least I could tell what Jay was saying. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, there were some specific times where, like, one song specifically started where it was, like, his voice was really low so you couldn't hear what he was saying at first, and then it, and then the sound just jumped up at you, and it's just like, okay, I know you did that on purpose. Why are you doing this? Why are you making it so that we can't hear what you're saying? <laughs> and And I get it, if that's the fucking, like, aesthetic, because that goes back to, to yeah, Odd yeah. Future. And I, I'm sorry, Lee, that type of production style, like, it gets annoying to me at times. Like, I do like experimentation, but after a while, it's just like, damn it, I want to listen to the song. <laughs> I want to actually enjoy listening to your music, guys. With this, I, fa- I found out his parents aren't, like, regular fucking people. They're a big goddamn deal. I was listening oh, to Oh, yeah, Plague. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to fucking Plague Possum. I was like, Jesus Christ. His mom is Arthur Gilbert. Uh, foundation chair in civil rights and civil liberties at UCLA Law School, and his dad is a South African poet and political activist. That's like when I found out that uh, King Princess, they're a uh, like singer songwriter type, um, kind of poppier. Uh, that their uh, great great grandparents were Isidore Strauss and Ida Strauss. They were uh, co-owners of Macy's, and they both died on the Titanic. Uh, uh, Oh! (laughs) What I have written down for the song um, Azucar Mm. is that the song sounds like it's swerving on ice. (laughs) Which, like, anything to fucking keep it interesting, like, I'm, I'm fine with, you know? It was just like, I like when a song sounds like it's out of control. It was slightly offbeat. Uh, it was slightly mm. offbeat, kind of like uh, that Ghostface Killer song. Uh, um, what's that one? I think it's Buck Fifty, where that goes. Or like oh. <laughs> RZA accidentally messed up and like put his hand on like the recording and it and it made it fall out of time. And Ghostface Killer was like, "Nah, I like that shit. Keep that like that." But it's like that sort of like if you're into it, that 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 is what this album is. That Earl, th- this is that's what Earl Sweatshirt is. That Stroke of Death song. It's like it's really weird and off putting. But if you're into that, you're totally gonna be into this. You know, like that's the only thing you could say. I would not say that Earl is a shitty rapper. I wouldn't even necessarily say that this yeah. is a bad EP. Just That's exactly what it is, yeah. Rating my enjoyment, I rank mm. my enjoyment as a two, because I didn't really dig it, I wasn't really here for it, um, but then again, it's just not really for me, I guess. But I feel like this is an album, like you had said, for people who are uh, very much into what this EP is. Um, fans of his are no doubt going to love it. But I just need, personally, more polish in my shit. Uh, I don't know, like, a bit more energy? Yeah, you can't deny that, yeah. That there really wasn't anything for me. It's like, okay, is he charismatic and does he have cool, witty lyrics? No, not really. Okay, are the beats at least fucking, like, bangers and do they slap? No, not really. Then I'm not going to get anything out of this then, I guess. <laughs> All right. Like, that's just on me. And I know anyone commenting isn't going to take it that way. But seriously, like, I didn't go into this EP expecting it to be shit or anything. And the first time I listened to it, I actually had the inverse where I liked it more. And then I listened to it the second time with the lyrics. And I was like, I don't fucking get any of this shit. This isn't resonating with me at all. I don't like it. So it's like when I had less of an idea what was going on, I liked it more. But then when I actually took the time to, like, give it my undivided attention, I was like, oh. Mm. Wow, we had the opposite. <laughs> we did. Yeah. <laughs> the like, funny how it the, happens. Those fucking loud-ass, repeating, like, really minimal samples, they just got on my nerves. And I was like, 
I was like, I get it if you like that sample, man, but you gotta turn that shit down, because I can't hear you over that shit. Well, yeah. I, I give it a, a three and a half. Okay. I, I definitely see the value in what he's doing, but, like... Yes, there is the element of the lo-fi, unfinished thing. Then I'm contradicting because, like, it's not all the way whack. Because, like I said, December 24th, he blows that shit out of the water. But I do want to highlight playing Possum, the fact that what was happening in that song was him playing a speech from his mom and a speech from his dad. Oh, yeah, in, uh, yeah, where it was, like, playing kind of, like, congruently on top of each other, taking turns. That was interesting. I kind of like that. And what was happening in the song was, like, his mom was, was like, thanking a whole bunch of people in her life. You know, thankful to, I'm thankful to my son, I'm thankful to all these people who helped me, and da da, da some sort of, like, you know, speech at some grad thing. Mm. And uh, the, the dad was, like, giving a speech about, you know, people who are homeless, people who are immigrants, who don't have as much of a family structure, who mm. are wanderers, and, you know, they don't have that home they don't have that uh, uh structure of family and help and people that can you oh, know shit help them you know live their dreams you know what i'm saying instead of just living mm. day to day and it, it was just so fascinating that contrast like it wasn't just random like i could feel like something was going on and then like to look it up and be like oh shit that's like that's a fucking art piece right there like i would not be surprised if this was submitted into a museum that specific <laughs> track because that was honestly just like a fascinating experience i wouldn't have predicted something like that amongst uh the other stuff on here that like that was sort of to me felt like an example of how weird this album could have gone that one specifically felt like there was more going on it was just like whoa i would not have expected a song like this after the last three songs were like basically five minutes all together and like almost 16 bar verses you know well that about does it for this week's episode of the going off podcast big thanks to dory and dawes for joining us on the show We're gonna have to have them on again um in the future Maybe when we don't have such heavy news topics, just fucking have a little chill out sesh. That's usually what we do. Go play some video games, you know? That That's usually what we do when we have the guest on for the second time. Like when we had Dan on or uh, Open Mic Eagle. This, the, the first time is when we get to know them. It's, like, it's that first episode where you mm. get all the exposition out there exactly. in the introductions. The second episode is supposed to be more light. And this time it wasn't so much. But next time. <laughs> I promise you next time. <laughs> Um, and, uh, if, well, we didn't do a Patreon request this week, but if there is an album that you'd like to hear us talk about that we probably wouldn't talk about otherwise, maybe a little bit older, maybe an album that isn't exactly in our direct wheelhouse, uh, check us out on either patreon.com slash rap critic or patreon.com slash muse for details and how you can request an album to be reviewed on the podcast. Check us out on Twitter, see what we're talking about throughout the week, because it usually gives you a good idea of what we're going to be talking about on the podcast. Subscribe to us on our YouTubes. If this is your first time listening, all of our old episodes are on SoundCloud and iTunes. Just search Going Off Podcast. That's G-O-I-N apostrophe off podcast. And fuck with my TikTok and my Instagram, too. <laughs> <laughs> Check us out on Teespring. Check us out on TikTok or at least we're, Rap Critic. We're, Check we're expanding. Out Look, we expanded. We expanded, yo. It's a brand. It's a global brand. <laughs> that I mean, I wasn't thinking of that term, but maybe... <laughs> Oh, Rap Critic Industries! <laughs> Sky's the limit! <laughs> um, but uh, that does it for this week's episode of the podcast. And until next week, I'm Muse. And I'm Rap Critic, and we're the baddest blokes on the block. <laughs>